Uh, my name is uh, Josh Trueblood. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship. It's a privilege to be with you guys here today in this service and with you guys online. Uh, we love you guys. This is not just a church that you attend. We are a family that we want you to belong to. So as we go into this next parable, we've been in the parables of Jesus Christ for the last several weeks. Today's parable is a doozy. Um, the, now, parable, if, if you're just tracking with us for the first time, maybe today, a parable is a story that Jesus told to illustrate something, but it wasn't necessarily or always trying to make the concept easier to understand. It was actually, it was meant to, to draw us in so that we would listen to the voice of God more deeply into, in, in our lives. And, and some of you guys know the experience. Some concepts are harder to understand. They take a little bit more thought. They take a little bit more trust. They take us getting quiet in our hearts. Today is one of them. Matthew 13, verse 24. Are you ready? Let's go. Here's another story that Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. And when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to, to him, the farmer, and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? So the, if you were here the very first week, we talked about seeds and dirt and farmers. This is a different parable about seeds and dirt and farmers. And this one's got a little bit of a different twist. Now, some of you guys have gone to the store before and you needed a good bag of grass seed. And you could have gone for the cheap bag of grass seed. But you know what you would have gotten if you had gotten the cheap bag of grass seed? Likely, if you would have looked at the back, it would have told you that a certain percentage of those seeds were not actual grass. They were going to be other things, other things that you don't want. So this is the reality that Jesus is talking about. He planted good seed, and then an enemy came in and planted bad seed. So verse 28, an enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Shouldn't, should we pull out the weeds? Right now, they asked no, he replied, if you do, you'll uproot the wheat. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and put the wheat in the barn. Okay, so you got the good farmer planted the good wheat seed, and then you got the enemy that came in overnight. And now think enemy. Think a competitive farmer that doesn't want this farmer to succeed. An enemy comes in, and they do one of the worst things that you can do to another farmer's field, is they fill it with bad stuff. This was an actual problem in the ancient world. Some competitive farmers would do this to other farmers in order to shut them down. Roman law in the ancient world actually had laws on the books with consequences for sowing weeds in another farmer's field. This is historically documented. Now, the Greek there for the word weed is zizania. Say zizania. zizania. Isn't that fun? Zizania. So zizania isn't just any weed. It's a very specific kind of weed. At least we believe it was. Something called darnel wheat, which was a fake kind of wheat. Darnel wheat. Now, why is this important? Because when you think weeds, you kind of think, I'm going to look out over my uh, lush green lawn, right, in Oklahoma. Lush green lawn. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> I'm going to look over at my lush green lawn, and I'm going to see a single um, dandelion in there. It's going to sprout up with a, a big yellow flower on top, and I'm going to know the weed, and I'm going to go and pluck that thing out. That's not what he's talking about here. Darnell wheat, what would happen is, is, is this, this wheat, this particular thing, it is a, a close cousin to actual wheat. And when they're growing up together, they actually look the exact same. You can't tell the difference. You can't distinguish. Not up until the very last moment, right before harvest, when the real wheat gets that top, that sprout of grain on top, the ear. And as soon as that pops up, you can actually tell a color difference between the two right before harvest. And so Jesus is coming in here and saying, the part of the reason that you couldn't, couldn't weed it initially is because you wouldn't be able to tell. Now, like we, we did in several of these weeks, the disciples didn't just want the parable, they wanted the explanation. Do you remember that? 
So they go to Jesus privately, and they go into a house, and they say, Jesus, would you explain it? Here's what he says. Chapter 13, 37, the son of man is the farmer, he says, who plants the good seed. The, the field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil ones. The seeds are people. What kind of person are you? The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. And the harvesters are the angels. Jesus gives you all the players. Verse 40, just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from God's kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can we just acknowledge right away, we do not like these verses in the Bible. These are not the fun ones. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom, and anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. There he is again. If you've got ears to hear, you need to listen, and you need to understand. You need to take time. You need to peer in because it's worth it. So what are we supposed to learn from this? You're like, well, it seems obvious. He told us what all the players are, but he doesn't tell you why he's telling you the parable. Why, Jesus? Why give us this picture? So I'm, I'm going to give you some guesses. Because I think, I think Jesus has actually got a lot of different things that might come into our character if we peer in at this parable. Number one thing, number one lesson is that if you go pulling weeds now, you'll pull the wrong thing. Why? Because we can't see into someone's soul And you might look around and think that you know who the Christians are and who the Christians aren't, but you might be wrong. And so Jesus comes in and says, these two look the same until the very end, and so we're going to wait until the harvest. But don't get ahead of yourselves because you don't have spiritual x-ray ability. Imagine the way that that the gospels actually played out. And do you remember the thief on the cross next to Jesus who was dying next to Jesus? And he was a criminal and he was actually justly condemned for what he had done. And all of a sudden, at the very last few moments of his life, he reached out to Jesus for salvation and Jesus gave it to him. Seconds, maybe, minutes before this guy died, he switched from Darnell wheat to actual wheat. DNA change spiritually. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. You change. And that man was changed. No one would have seen that coming. Nicodemus, Pharisee. You could even say the the Pharisees were the enemies of Jesus. They, They went after him. He went after them a bit. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. You're not sure what's going to happen to Nicodemus. All of a sudden, you get to the end of the Gospels, and Nicodemus, the Pharisee, is defending Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Obviously, he's had a change of heart. Who would have seen that coming? Not us. And then if people would have looked at Judas, and they would have said, he's part of the inner circle, and he's one of the 12. Surely, he's somebody who is getting in to heaven. I don't claim to know what the eternal destiny of Judas was, but he was not a good guy, amen? We're not so good at knowing. Not only can we not see, but we don't know people's future. And so God on some level is saying, hey, how about hands off of that? How about we not be so judgy? You're like, well, can I tell a tree by its fruit? That's a whole other sermon and a whole other thing. But Jesus is coming into here and saying, how about we not judge? And I know this is a weird thing for me to talk about because the church historically has never had a problem with judgment. I'm glad you laughed at that. That's that's good. That means you're listening a little. The other lesson I get is that... um, not only is it difficult to distinguish until the very end, and only God can, but as they grow together, the roots get tangled. And he even says there, he says, if you go to start yanking weeds out, you're going you're gonna to yank good wheat too. You're, and, and some of you guys have done that for real in your yards. You know, I mean, you, you've pulled up the wrong things. And Jesus is like, What if God right now started coming in and yanking all the bad out of this world? You might think that you want that, but you also might find that you're a bit tangled into some of those things. 
And you're a bit tangled into some of those people. Because if God started weeding now, you got some family members that you might be a little bit attached to, might be praying for, might be sharing the truth with and trying to love. Amen? Amen. You got some people in your community, some people in your church, some people in your school. And there's this impulse that should come out of us that says, God, I am tangled. Praise God I'm tangled. But take your time. Let's wait until the end. Do you see what God is doing with us? And, and it's tough because we have a natural impulse toward uh, justice. And that's God given. That, that's, that's supposed to be in us. We, we should want the sorting to happen. We should want the right consequences to go to the right person. And you're like, well, I'm not judgy. Well, what about child abuse for a second? Don't we want child abusers to get dealt with? Come on, somebody. Especially if you've been touched by that yourself and assault victims. And we start thinking, not only do, do I wish that God would pluck those people right out of here right now, but I, I, I kind of wish that God would see the ones who will become that and just go ahead and pre-pluck them, God. And God says, you don't know. You don't know where all this is going. And I know your inner sense of justice, which is God-given It's good and it's right, but it needs to wait because the ultimate judge who has perfect justice, he is willing to wait and his patience is the thing. So God wants everyone saved and that's why he gives people time. God gives people time. That's the point of this parable. God gives people time. Some of you here needed time. Some of you here, you've got a story and you could say, this is the time in my life when I was not for Jesus and then I found Jesus. Thank God I didn't get sorted back here. Yeah, we needed time. They need time. And so God gives time in his grace. He gives people time. Time to what? Time to hear the truth. Time to come to their senses. Time to repent. Time to get forgiven. Time to get saved. Time. And we need to use that time. This is 2 Peter 3 verse 9. Says it again. Said the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. As some people think, no, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to, to repent. Does that mean everyone will repent? No. But it means that the heart of the Father is that they would and it's an indication that he is, he is approaching human history and saying, I am doing all that I can to draw as many as I can. There will be no excuses left on the table. Not only did Jesus come to a cross to save you, but God has given you time and space to figure it out. And you even being here today might be a part of that. Maybe. Maybe the gigantic heart of God. And as Christians, if you're a Christian today, if you're someone who loves Jesus today, this is not just um, good information for you. You're meant to acquire the same gigantic heart that God has inside yourself. You're supposed to walk in that same way. Jude 22 through 23 says, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. Does that mean you can save a person? No, not really. What it means is that you should do all you can to love and to forgive and to walk the example of Jesus before a person. When they ask you questions, you give them the actual answers. You don't shrink back. You give them the quality time that you can and you love them desperately as much as you possibly can. Some of you guys got people in your life. You've been praying for them. Oh, God, let them find you. And some of us, some of us are in that space, but some of us have come to another space where we've kind of, we've kind of, um, we've taken this idea of our culture that it's all about us and it's all about me spending time for me. It's all about me living for me and it's all about my retirement, right? Picking seashells on the shore, all that good stuff. See, God's given us a different purpose here. How about, how about you come into the souls that are on the line and give yourself and give your time and give your resources to that? That time matters. 
Jesus is giving us a picture and he's like, you're in the growing season. The harvest hasn't happened yet. What are you going to do with the season that you're in? And then the the final lesson I see, and this is what we're going to spend all of our time in, the rest of our time in, is judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. One of the things that you see all throughout the scripture is that when God delays, there are people who will look at that delay and they will think this means God will never come. When judgment is delayed, judgment will never come. See, for generations and generations, millennia, we've all been going and and, and culture has been moving forward. This whole God thing, maybe it's not even real. And and he's coming in and he's helping us understand at the end of time, this is where it's headed for sure. These are the words of Jesus. I don't know if you caught that. Judgment is coming. Do not believe that delay means this is not where we're headed. It could be the most critical mistake of your eternity. That's heavy. <laughs> it's, it, it's funny to be talking about hell on child dedication day. I'm just going to say that. I, I'd be lying if I said I put all that together beforehand. I didn't. It's, it's a tough topic. On the, on the, you know, pastor preaching funnel meter, this is, rates pretty low on a topic to be talking about. But Jesus said it, and he spent a little bit of time on it. And it's, it's kind of the big thrust of that parable. And so when I look at the Lord of glory who, who loved us so much with his amazing grace and came to rescue us on the cross, and he's the guy in the room that's warning us about this, I can't sidestep it. I hope you can understand that. I can't go to the Bible and start editing out the pieces that I don't like. We got to talk about the things. We got to talk especially about the things that Jesus talked about. I can't sidestep it. Timothy Keller said it like this. He says, we must come to grips with the fact that Jesus said more about hell than Daniel, Isaiah, Paul, John, and Peter all put together. Before we dismiss the concept of hell, we have to realize that we are saying to Jesus, the preeminent teacher of love and grace in all of human history, I am less barbaric than you, Jesus. I am more compassionate and wiser than you. Surely that should give us pause. Hmm. Are you with me now? It's a serious subject. But you know, like, whoa, whoa. Why, do we, why would we talk about this? Maybe it's the most loving person in the room that wants to warn you the most about the danger that is present. And when they're warning you the most, maybe they're the most loving person in the room. That's why. And it's not the only space where Jesus speaks about this. Again, just like he said, we know more about what the Bible's teaching about hell actually is from the words of Jesus himself than any other biblical author. It's described by him. He prioritized it. <laughs> like, the, guy, the guy who loved the woman at the well? The guy who said he was without sin, let him cast the first stone? You mean that guy? The guy who went to the cross to die for us? He's all about amazing grace? You mean that guy? Is the guy that talked about hell. Yes. Yes. And that's a conflict for us in our psyche. we got to figure this out. Hell is, let me show you some of the words. Hell is eternal fire and punishment. That's Matthew 25. Hell is where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's Mark 9. Hell is, according to Jesus, outer darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you see the suffering that he's trying to describe to you there? And then ultimately in 2 Thessalonians, it means being shut out from the presence of the Lord. Shut out from the presence of the Lord. I've I've talked to husbands who after years of marriage look at their wife and say, if God hadn't given me her, I would not be the man that I am today. You ever heard people say that? They understand that there's something about the presence of this character and love with them 
that has changed them for the better. Take that to an absolutely infinite degree. Me in the presence of God is something. Me separated from the presence of God is suffering. Don't take him away from me. I need him. I need him to, to, to change me, not just to forgive me. I do need the forgiveness, and I need my past and my shame dealt with, but I also need to become a new person. And I want to become like Jesus. And his presence with me helps me to become like Jesus. And the version of me that's becoming like Jesus is the version that you might actually like to be around. That other version. To be separated from the presence of God. Okay, so we're going to talk some more about hell and judgment, and final judgment. And I'm going to reach out to you today because some of you have not heard this teaching before. Some of you have heard this teaching wrong before. And this is going to feel deep to you. Again, I know it's Child Dedication Sunday. All right. This is going to be deep. It's going to be a little bit brainy. And and, and the reason I'm going to lean into the braininess of all this is because I respect you. And I want you to know the truth. And I'm not going to do a flyby on this because I think too many people have done too many flybys on this for you in the past. So we're going to dig into it. Um, I'll acknowledge that in, in past centuries of the church, there have been some pastors and commentators and, and, and poets and painters that have painted pictures for you of hell that I don't agree with. Some of them have been cartoonish and they've been silly to you. Some of them, on the flip side, some of their pictures of hell have been sadistic. They have pictured a loving and merciful and forgiving God intentionally creating unending pain and torture in every way that he possibly could to people. And you have railed at that. And so have I. And the reason down deep you have railed at that is because that is not the God that is presented in all the rest of scripture to you. Oh, now we're quiet. Now we're with me. It's a big deal. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see what this thing actually is. When it comes to fire, when it comes to darkness, I'll just let you know, I believe those things are pictures that are meant to evoke the kind of suffering and isolation that hell will be for you. Now, why do I say that? Because a few reasons. Number one, Jesus' teaching on hell was primarily toward people before the final judgment, and he was talking about people that were going straight to a place called Gehenna. If you're a Bible student this morning, you're going to follow this part. And what went is their spirits, not their bodies. How how are spirits burning? I don't believe that they are physically. I don't believe that they are. It doesn't make sense. Also, why do we have fire and we have outer darkness? Last time I checked up on fire, it's pretty bright. So what's going on here? I think Jesus means us to see that it's not the actual literal picture that he's trying to describe exactly what the place called hell will look and be like exactly. He's trying to evoke this is more than what you can imagine when it comes to suffering. He's the same thing with heaven. He says, it will be so much better than you can possibly imagine or have ever imagined. And I believe hell, we need to wake up to the reality of the suffering that it will be. I don't believe Jesus gives us this in order to freak us out and scare us into the kingdom. I don't think that works. But I do believe he gives us this as smelling salts to wake us up. Because many of us grew up in a culture that tells us that the place doesn't exist. Many of us grew up in a culture that says, because God hasn't brought it yet, he won't eventually bring it. And he will. He will. Even Jonathan Edwards, the great theologian, says that he believed the reality of hell would be far worse than the images given in Scripture. 
J.I. Packer put it this way. Scripture sees hell as self-chosen. Hell appears as God's gesture of respect for human choice. Now follow that for a second. Hell is God's respect for human choice. All receive what they actually choose, either to be with God forever, worshiping him on the one side, or without God forever, worshiping themselves. You follow the the parables. Jesus is always saying the, the, the kingdom of God is like this. And the alternative is the kingdom of you. It's the kingdom of this world. But it's the kingdom of you, and you don't want that. You've had that for far too long. You want the kingdom of God. And Packer is saying that hell is a choice. And hell is a choice to live an eternal existence existence on my own terms, according to my own choices. Take all of my character qualities and send them right down through eternity. Because the negative character qualities in me and in you, are they getting better or are they getting worse? Many of us, they're getting worse. Separated from the teachings of Jesus. There's a movie, I'm going to use this to illustrate this. There's a movie called Knives Out. Have you ever seen it? Knives Out. It's a murder mystery. It's super fun. A little twisted, but it's super fun. And, and the really fun part is that the main grandpa guy um, at the center of the whole thing, he's Captain Von Trapp, basically. Um, Christopher Plummer is his name. Anyway, um, he's, he's a super fun guy and great in the role and all this kind of stuff. But what you've got is he's this super um, successful author and he's amassed all this money because he's been so successful at what he's done. And they all live in this monstrous mansion together with all his extended family and they're all there. All of his kids and all of their kids. So his grandkids. And so they got all of these people and they're all fighting and backbiting the entire movie to try to get the guy's money. And they've all been reduced to their absolute worst selves. And when you watch this movie and you're trying to figure out who did it, I won't tell you who died. You might be able to figure that out. But you're getting profiles of these different people jammed into this space. And what you start to realize is even though they're so wealthy, they're some of the poorest people you've ever seen in your life. And even though they're all jammed in this house together, they're some of the loneliest people that you've ever seen in your life. Because the selfishness that has driven them, the total self-centeredness, and the backbiting, and the relationship breakdown that's going in, and the way that they're, they're teaching their kids the same kind of greed and cruelty and anger, and on and on and on it goes. Imagine being trapped in that house for all eternity as it gets worse and worse and worse down through the generations. Does that sound like fun to you? Could you imagine being trapped in Las Vegas for the rest of eternity? And you might see it through the lens of a tourist, but hold on for a second. And the greed and the sex slavery, right? And the selfishness and the addiction and all the things that run that place at its heart. I don't mean to visit. I mean to live there and be there for all eternity inside of a kingdom that runs according to that kingdom's rules, I would say that is misery and fire and outer darkness for all eternity. And you're like, well, some people don't get it. And I understand some people don't get it. But this is the way that it works. The closer to God you get, the more you understand the misery you have come from. And there are people that you know and you're like, you're living in misery, dude. And you don't even know it. But the worse that gets, you may one day wake up to how miserable you actually are. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, hell begins with a grumbling mood. Anybody ever have a grumbling mood? Just a couple of us. Where you're always complaining, always blaming others, but you're still distinct from the mood. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish that you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer stop the mood. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even enjoy it but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing, which will be hell, unless it is nipped in the bud. 
is doing there is he's coming into our human condition and saying, you are pre-tasting hell already. And you can't imagine how bad it's going to get. Because at the judgment, God will say, you, you refuse that my will be done, therefore your will be done. And you don't want that. The suffering, the misery that is in all of that. Revelation 22, verse 11 says, let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. This is a picture of the judgment. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and the beginning and the end. I want you to imagine people coming before God and him saying, what you have chosen for yourself and for your eternity, you get. But please don't take it. Please don't take it. God respects the human choice. And there's something about our character that one day will get set in stone and we will live eternity with ourselves. Don't do it. Jesus is so good. Jesus has come to warn us. Isaiah 53, verse 5 through 6, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Some of you guys are in here and you're hearing this and it's just another sermon and you're, you're moving on to lunch. God bless you. Some of you, this is piercing your heart right now and I'm talking to you. God did not come to abandon you to yourself. Jesus came to save you. You got to see a God in heaven who said, I'm not going to let them to themselves. I'm not just going to send an email. I'm not just going to give them the Bible and say, figure it out. I'm going to go and I'm going to rescue them. And I'm going to find a way for them. Reach out a hand toward them. And not only that, but I'm going to suffer hell for them. Do you see Jesus today? Do you see Jesus' desperation to reach out to you and say, the parable says God gave you time. Don't squander your time. Choose him. You don't even know what you're doing. Choose him. Everything that is good in your life, everything that is love, everything that is forgiveness, everything that is mercy and patience, it's all him. Reach out to him today. He died on a cross for you. You're like, well, why did he die on a cross? Because he died for your sins to establish your choice and you get to choose him now or you get to choose you now. What will you choose? The scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. That's good news because he doesn't just forgive your past. He makes you something new. The weed DNA shifts to wheat. You're a new creation now. That's what he came to do for you. Will you reach out and receive him? Will you reach out and be real with you, and be honest with you? Will you say, I want you to be Lord and master of my life now, not me anymore. I've screwed this up way too much. I've had my shot, and I know where, where the kingdom of me, I know where it leads And I don't want that anymore. And so I give that up and I surrender it to you. Take the wheel, Jesus. I know it's a country song. Move on. It's okay. (laughs) There's a verse in Hebrews. It says, today if you hear his voice, do not turn away. I love that verse. It's one of my favorites because it just... It, it solidifies this idea of here you are with a chance to hear the truth and to change and to not just go to lunch. You went to lunch all the other times. Not against lunch. I'm just saying. 
today, if, if the God of the universe is pressing into your soul, don't miss it. Today, if you hear his voice, don't turn away. Surrender it all. He's the only one you can trust. Would you guys stand? I'm going to pray a prayer with you, and it's based on a a passage. It's Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It says, here are these two steps. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, step one, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus now is in control of my life, he's my master, he's my Lord, that's what it's about. I'm surrendering. I want my eternity with him, directed by him now. If I believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So we're going to pray right now. If you've been to our church, you know that we do this on occasion. Sometimes we pray a prayer together, and we're just going to whisper one phrase at a time. And These are not magic words, by the way. It's not words that you have to get right. Because God can x-ray your heart and he knows exactly where you're at. That thief on the cross, when he prayed, you should have seen his prayer. It was a mess. That's all right. Your words can be a mess today. And God sees you and he knows what you mean. So would you bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, save me. Be my Lord. Be my master. I've done it my way. Forgive my past. Forgive my shame. Set me on a new course. I want to be close to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for speaking to me today. Please, God, change my life. In Christ's name, amen. I just want to say this briefly to you. We're about to sing. But all this week, preparing this message, thinking about this topic, I think about when this reality hit me, and I think about the people in my life that haven't yet surrendered to God yet, and people that are still struggling, people are still seeking, still asking questions, still trying to find God, people who are far from God. And I gotta tell you the desperation and prayer that I have had for those people this week. This is eternity. Amen.